Greetings, everybody. How are you? Let me change that. Change the background. There we go, because we are not in a few minutes. We have Kahoot today. I know you guys are going to be excited. Uh, Prague, uh, Prague National, you're an old winner of the Kahoot. Well, you, you're probably glad to hear that. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you. Uh, Prague National, how are you doing? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you you play, you like, you like Kahoot, right? Yes, I do. But today I may have to, today I may have to leave earlier, so I'm not sure how long I will be there. But uh, if I am there, I will definitely like to participate. But I may have to finish early. Okay, well, maybe I can figure out, I can send you a link or something to it. Okay, you got my email address, right? Or Facebook? Friend, are you my Facebook friend? Because you can contact me and say, John, I would like to have the Kahoot from the Jordan webcast. You know what I'm saying, Pragnesh? Are you there still? Yeah, I'm there. I'm muted myself. Yes, I'm there. Yeah, uh, I'll give you my email here. And uh, write to me and ask for the Kahoot if, if you have to leave early. I would thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Good morning, Dr. Sabaya. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm fine. Yeah, I got the Kahoot done. Good, that's good. Yeah, um, it, every time you get better, you get faster. 
Absolutely. And, and, and that's good. You get the questions are short. Uh, it makes it easy for me. Yeah, exactly. And it's makes it easy for the participants too. Yeah, I'm glad you like it. I'm glad you like it. No, I do. I do. Yeah, I, do. I think that as a teacher, I think you realize the potential. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, we're starting a series of neuroanatomy with Victor. I'm, you know Victor. Absolutely, I know him very well. Yeah, he's doing, in Spanish, he's doing a web, a 10, 12 webcasts, uh, one a week covering, uh, you know, the basics of neurosurgery in all the major areas. And we're going to use Kahoot for... for yeah, the kids, I think the kids like it. Kids, they know it more than the people our age, but... Uh, it's anatomy. Again, anatomy is the base of everything. And uh, anatomy of the brain is the Achilles tendon of every doctor in the world. Yeah, it's. I didn't realize how important it was until I, because I didn't know. I'm not a neurosurgeon. I don't have too much of a background. Sure, sure, sure. Like one one month rotation in residency. Exactly. But I, but I really didn't get into the, the neuroanatomy. I mean, how how important it is. How, how how continual it is. Not not just learning it in med school and forgetting about it. Happened. <laughs> Professor Rotten used to say that you have to have this X-ray image in your mind of the brain. Uh, so you see through and you see in 3D. That's far beyond and before the 3D concept was created. Well, you know, that's my basic hypothesis of why neurosurgeons seem to grasp Zoom better than most specialties. Sure. Exactly, exactly what you said about the 3D visualization. You guys been doing that before? It was internet, probably. Absolutely. You know, yeah, you, you had to visualize it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I have a feeling because I can't say for sure, but it's just a feeling. Uh, like cardiology, dermatology, really it's hasn't different. caught on. Uh, it's different. In the yeah, 70s, in the 70s, when I was still a medical student, uh, we used to read the anatomy from books having the sagittal, the coronal, the axial cuts of the anatomy. Far much, much before the MRI concept of it. Like, like a cardboard cutout thing? Abs absolutely, yes. You have to know the wrist, for example, in different uh, visualization. You have to see the abdomen in different visualization. That was before the era of the MRI in the 3D. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because obviously neurosurgeons had to operate without the CT. Amazing. They used just yeah. to use the, the, the pneumoencephalogram or the CT to imagine what, what they should be. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, it wouldn't help, but, but uh, that's probably all I could offer. Yeah. Um, do you feel you have all the equipment you need as far as backup in Amman? Absolutely, yes. We are very, very well equipped in, in terms of uh, resources and everything. So well, in my, yeah, please. Well, yeah, let me just run a proposal by you before we start. But there's a neurosurgeon from Sri Lanka that would like to have a webcast and contrast how he treats it in the third world as opposed to maybe someone like you that would have more equipment available. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, sure, sure. sure. I yeah, mean, we, well, well, that's great. I couldn't get any Americans to do it. Yeah, I'm happy. Uh, More than happy. But, but if you if you would like to do it, that'd be great. Sure, no problem with me. Okay, good. He'll be glad to hear because he's been trying for a while. I just haven't been able to get something. But, yeah. but I think that'll be very interesting. I, I, I told you before, John, that uh, Jordan is the medical hub in the Middle East, and that is a true uh, thing. Well, yeah, it would be good to show that, too. Yeah, in, in yeah, the yeah, yeah. Because you'll be essentially representing countries that have the equipment. Absolutely. And that don't have to, you know, improvise and, and try different things here. Yeah. Okay, let me, uh, oh, man. Okay, there we go.
Yeah, we, you don't have to improvise, so you can, uh, it would, well, I think it would look good for your, for Armand. Sure, sure. So, yeah, he, he, we had a really good grand rounds of Sri Lanka. He took us on a tour of the island, beautiful island. Have you ever been there, Sri Lanka? Uh, no, actually, I, I wanted to go, I'd love to go, but I, I just, it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of places to go, but uh, that's where James Michener. I, the only re reason I knew about it was the writer James Michener. He's a very this, prolific yeah, yeah, yeah. writer. You probably yeah, Hawaii. He's written a lot sure, of big books. Absolutely. But he lived. He lived in Sri Lanka. Yeah, yeah. I have lots of Sri Lankan friends and doctors and so on. Oh, you do? Yeah, I do. Oh, okay. Very good. Maybe you know them. Yeah, he took us on a tour of the island, and uh, then he took us on a tour of the neurosurgery parts of the island, you know, where the, I guess, the one trauma center is, where they, and where the other centers are in the, in the various places. But mm -hmm. yeah, he came to me, he said, John, I have an idea. Uh, I'd like to contrast the way I treat neurosurgical problems with the way a developed country does. Sure. Uh, so uh, yeah, that, that's that's great. I, I wasn't even thinking of that. Yeah, but he'll be, he'll be excited to hear that. Sure, you can give him my name, my phone number, and he can get in touch with me. No problem. Oh, he'll be very happy to hear that. Very happy. Yeah, me too. Okay, okay you ready? I am. Okay, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, <coughs> four, three, two. Good afternoon, this is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach, Florida, home of Neurosurgical TV. We have another uh, Jordan Neurosurgery uh, Grand Rounds with Ibrahim Sabaya, well-known educator in the Middle East. He's been doing these for a while. I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Sabaya. Good day, Dr. Sabaya. Good day, John. Thank you very much indeed for this introduction and we'll proceed. Can you see my slides? Yes, perfect. Super. So hello everybody. Uh, this is me, Abraham Sway from Jordan. And I'm talking to you from the Farah Medical Campus here in Amman, Jordan. Uh, this is Petra of Jordan, the jewel of the crown of uh, the tourism industry in the Middle East, one of the world's seven wonders. And this is the black iris, the symbol of Jordan. Today I'm going to talk about falcotentorial meningiomas. And I have to stress the fact falcotentorial meningiomas are not the same like tentorial meningiomas. Falcotentorial meningiomas is a subgroup of tentorial meningiomas. So we have to make this distinction between tentorial and falcotentorial. Falcotentorial is a subgroup of tentorial. Because of this uh, lack of discrimination in literature, so you cannot really come to grasp with, the, with the, how many cases and so on and so forth, because they are just put together. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk on, about overview of this, of the falcotentural meningiomas, as usual from the anatomical, pathological, radiological, uh, and operative management. And I'll uh, introduce also my personal series on the topic. <clears throat> Falcotentorial meningiomas are most complex of tumors. They are the really challenging lesions, and their learning curve is steep and long. It is not for the amateurs, it's not for the beginners. It, you know, you have to know lots of things before you dare and do such a case. So what is the falcotentorial meningioma? Falcotentorial meningioma, this is the forks and this is the tents. It is here at the junction of the forks and the tents. So we are talking about this junction. Falco tentorial uh, uh, junction, uh, whether it is supratentorial or infratentorial. So let's look at this falco tentorial junction. So this is the falx, this is the tent, which is heaped up like a tent. And this is the tentorial hiatus through which the brain stem passes. So this is the falx, and this is the tent, and here is the straight signs. So we're talking about tumors meningiomas occurring in this junction, whether above the tent or below the tent. Again, here the forks, 
here the tentorium, and this is the junction where the state signs. Uh, 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 some voice, uh, some voices are appearing. Anyway. Can you unmute yourself, please? Because there are lots of noises here. So let's speak about the tentorial hiatus through which the brainstem passes. We have the anterior uh, part, the middle part, and the posterior part. The anterior part is corresponding to the cosmetic system, the crust, the middle is corresponding to the ambient system, and the posterior part is corresponding to the quadrigeminal system. Quadrigeminal system corresponds to what we are talking about today, which is the falcotentorial meningiomas. So here we are, we're looking from above on the right side, anterior fossa, middle fossa, posterior fossa, tent here. We have removed the leaflets of the tent. We are looking at the uh, surface, tentorial surface of the cerebellum. This is the midbrain aqueduct, the crust. And here's the anterior and sensorial space, middle and posterior. We've been concentrating on this quadrigeminal system or posterior and sensorial space. Here we are the anterior, the middle, and the posterior incisional space. And this is from the back, and this is the apex of the forks, which slopes down like this. So what are the structures that you uh, are able, uh, and they are, you must face when you come to uh, operate in this area? <clears throat> Arteries, veins, sinuses, cranial nerves, cerebellum, and brainstem. Let's have a look. First of all, let's speak about the blood vessels, the blood supply. What is the blood supply of this tentorium? Many arteries, actually. Pseudopericolosal of the anterior uh, cerebral artery, middle meningeal, branch of the external carotid, accessory middle meningeal, the same. Meningeal bufizial and lateral trunk are branches of the uh, cavernous carotid. Severe cerebellar artery contributes to the blood supply, posterior cerebral artery, and the cerebral artery. So it is rich in the blood supply. What am I saying this? Because if you want to operate in this area, you have to master the anatomy because you'll have lots of problems if you don't. This is a beautiful paper. I encourage everybody to read. Uh, it's by late Albert Troughton, whom I visited many times in, in Miami uh, as a resident, as a trainee. Uh, I owe him a lot. He is uh, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's a master of anatomy. Uh, so this is paper is just to speak about the microsurgical anatomy of the dural arteries. Middle meningeal supply this part of the tent, the, the anterior branch or the posterior branch. And from the cavernous carotid, you have the two arteries, the meningeal trunk and the inferior lateral trunk. Here is the inferior lateral trunk and the meningeal hypophyseal, which divides here into a meningeal branch and tranquil branch, meningeal branch, dorsal meningeal, clival artery, and then the uh, tentorial branches are medial and lateral. So this is the meningeal hypophyseal artery, and this is the uh, inferior lateral trunk both coming from the cavernous carotid and both contributing to the blood supply of the tent. Again, a view to see the carotid, giving here the uh, meningeal trunk with its branches to the tent and to the uh, back of the clivus. So this is posterior meningeal, clival artery, median and lateral internal arteries, and the inferior lateral trunk, which goes and gives a branch of severe orbital fissure, foramen rotunda, and foramen ovale, and it's anastomosing here with the ophthalmic artery and so on. So these anastomoses are very important, and we'll address that later on. So in this paper, you can see that this is the, the blood supply that comes to the lateral part of the tentorium by the lateral tentorial artery and the medial tentorial artery. It happens these arteries are called Bernasconi and Casinari, and in literature they're known as the Italian arteries. I think every uh, neurosurgical resident knows them because their names are musical kind of thing. The serous cerebral artery also contributes to the blood supply of the uh, falcotentorial junction. This is what is called as artery of Davidoff and Schuster, and this goes around the brainstem like this and supply this area. 
So this area is richly blood supply with arteries and with veins. So this is the posterior cerebral artery. This is the area supplied by the artery of David and Schuster. This way, this is the artery, which usually you don't see it on the usual normal angiogram, but you will see it if you have a falcotentorial meningioma. Severe cerebellar artery, and it's um, and the fissure here between the uh, mesenchymatic cerebellar fissure, cerebellar mesenchymatic fissure. It gives also a branch in here to the uh, tentorium. Last but not least, the vertebral artery. We forget about the vertebral artery giving the branches to the dura uh, via its uh, posterior meningeal branch that goes really right up to the uh, turcular junction and uh, above. Ascending uh, pharyngeal artery is the missed artery here. Nobody think about it. Why should an ascending pharyngeal be contributing to the blood supply of the of the tent? It is actually through its um, uh, jugular branch and hypoglossal branch. It's anastomosing here with the other branches to give to the uh, this leaflet of the tent. So in summary. The falcotentorial junction is extremely rich with the blood supply and venous tributaries. Here you are, and various anatomical specimens. What about veins? What about venous chances? This is a beautiful paper uh, using seven Tesla to show you the uh, venous system. Beautiful, really beautiful illustration of how the MRI is developing. Seven Tesla, nine Tesla, eleven Tesla, and so on. Look at this here: the internal cerebral artery, the vein of Rosenthal, gallon. Again, the sinuses, the straight sinus and its branches, and so on. The blood supply of the brainstem, the venous tributaries. My best photo is this. My best picture is this. This is taken from Yazaji. And I read the, all the volumes of Yazajil as a resident. I'm still using them up to date. I'm still looking at them. And every time I read from Yazajil, I, I find something different. I find some new information. But this is really beautiful. Uh, this is the uh, septal arc, a vein. This is the straight vein forming internal cerebral vein on this side and on this side, joining together to form vein of gallon joined here by vein of Rosenthal. Uh, it's, uh, this is the inferior sagittal sinus. And these are the venous sinuses of the tent, and the beyond is the, uh, the venous uh, tributaries from the uh, fossa. Now this junction here, it's not just, just like that. It has so many variations. So this junction, look at here, where they, they join. They don't join the vein of the they join the straight sinus here. In the middle of the straight sinus. And so on. So the, the variations of the venous tributaries are tremendous. I really don't understand how people would operate on any patient, on even the simplest of the brain tumors, without having the uh, vision or the image on the venous system. You will not find this information in books like Greenberg. I respect Marx. His book is good for students for me. Uh, revision just before the exam, but it does not give you the information that the SRGL books gives. Uh, another uh, thing that one has to remember are the arachnoid coverage of the junction of the internal cerebral vein with vein of gallon and with the pineal gland. So pineal gland here, vein of gallon, straight sinus. This beautiful paper about these arachnoid coverings and the quadrigeminal sister. Again, the vein of Rosenthal, well, it is forming here in the anterior percolator substance, getting its tributaries from everywhere, and then going around the brain stem, getting from the uh, ventricle, temporal horn in particular, and then join with the internal cerebral vein to vein and the vein of Dallin. With him, with them, the here is the uh, internal occipital vein. Again, this piece of information is essential. And you must not just know it, you must master it, you must have the 3D visualization of it. So quadrigeminous cistern here has a floor here, has a roof, and has a base here. 
This is the floor, sorry, this is the floor, this is the anterior wall, and this is the superior wall. So, superior wall, anterior wall, and, and, the, floor. Another... and the floor is made by the cerebellum. Uh, the anterior wall is made by the colloculi and the pineal gland, and the roof is made by the splenium and the internal cerebral vein is with the vein of gallon. So again, anatomical sections from splenium of the corpus callosum, the pineal glands, supra-pineal recess, pineal recess, serial commissure. And this is the quadrigeminal system where the two internal cerebral veins join to form the uh, vein of gallon together with resentile. So this is the view that you see, um, sorry. Something happened, John, trying to fix it. No. Uh... What, what? I think that's on your side. No. Somebody else has. No, I can hear you. So I'm connected to you, and you are connected to the Zoom. There you go. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Somebody yes. else uh, just shared, shared the screens. Oh, okay. So that anyway. was okay. Okay. That's okay there. Yes. Can you not please share the screen with us? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so, so we stopped here showing the quadrigeminal system and here the view that one would see if you are approaching the quadrigeminal system for whatever tumor you have there, this is the tent on the side, tent on the side, and then the antenna cerebral vein, vein of Rosenthal, ten occipital vein, ten cerebral vein, ten occipital vein of Rosenthal, and pre cerebellar vein, uh, precentral vein there. And if you remove the cerebellum, then you can get into the parahippocampal gyrus and you get into the cuneus uh, gyrus of the occipital uh, loop. So it is very complex anatomy and it must be mastered and it must be to the level of seeing it through. As Professor Leitroton said, uh, X-ray image in your mind to see through, to imagine the 3D configuration not just the information, but the configuration. So again, here the intensive vein and the veins on the back of the uh, quadrigeminal systems and the mesencephalic vein and throsal vein and so on. So it's a very complex uh, piece of anatomy. Thalamus is another structure that you will face and come across and here's the uh, back of the thalamus. Pulvinar and lateral geniculate body, the posterior commissure here, appendular commissure, and then the spherocolicoli and spherocolicoli and the pineal gland. So you are operating in this area and you have to know exactly where you are. Also, you will come across, as I said, the medial surface of the hemisphere. You will get into the calcarine sulcus. You will get into the, of course, calcarine sulcus here is the uh, occipital uh, parietal sulcus. This is the precuneus. And here is the visual cortex, so you have to know this. So the calcarine sulcus is really between the cuneus and lingula. Uh, this is the temporal or parieto occipital sulcus between the cuneus and the precuneus. And here is the parahippocampal gyrus. So again, the anatomy of the internal structures should be in your mind. So if you are going to that area and you slit open the tentorium here, you will get to the uh, parahippocampal gyrus, and you'll get it to the collateral sulcus, the fusiform gyrus, and so on and so forth. Uh, medial surface of the hemisphere. So this is the forks, this is the tentorium, this is the straight sinus. And if you want to operate here through trans uh, tentorial approach, and then you'll come across the calcarine sulcus, and your retractor can cause uh, blindness if you are not aware of the anatomy. The dural sinuses are very important. They can be the major drainage when there is an obstruction. So many papers around the tentorial hiatus. Uh, this is a beautiful paper about the uh, classifications of these dural sinuses. Cerebellum, you'll come across the cerebellum. Here covered by the tent on one side, here both sides are exposed. This is the tentorial hiatus. So you are in here, falco tentorial junction. So the anatomy here is of the, the most important, paramount importance 
much, much, much more any other parts in your body. So this is the cerebellum, spiriculaculus, spiriculaculus, the spirivermis of the cerebellum, and the very easy relationship with the dentate uh, nucleus of the cerebellum. Spiriculaculus, spiriculaculus, spirimodal cerebellum, spir uh, cerebellar tonsils, superior cerebellum peduncle, and if you damage that, you will go into the uh, fourth ventricle. So you are here, very delicate structures that you need to master the anatomy and know the fissures and so on. So differentiation between tentorial meningiomas and falcotentorial. Tentorial comprises with it the uh, falcotentorial. Falcotentorial is a subgroup of the tentorial meningiomas. So if we lump sum tentorial meningiomas all together, there are three to five percent of all meningiomas, and they have so many classifications. But the best classification that was done by Yezergil about 50 years ago, it still applies, still people use it. What did Yezergil say? Well, five groups either they are medial around the tentorial hiatus, or they are in the middle of the tent, or they are on the periphery of the tent. So, periphery of the tent, middle of the tent, or medial part of the tent, medial, paramedian lateral, falcotentorial, which is here, or circular, which is here. Very easy, very uh, surgically orientated. And if you really look at that, it's good. But this is tentorial meningiomas. We don't want tentorial meningiomas. We want the falcotentorial, but we'll come through to show you first the tentorial ones. So tentorial meningiomas, the best classification is done by Yezergir. So these are examples of the gene group. So this is the uh, anterior part, this middle part around the hiatus. And then you'll have this uh, around the straight sinus here. Here's then the facotentorial uh, description. Here it is in the periphery of the tent here. It's in the outside of the tent and so on and so forth. So really it makes very good sense of thinking what these uh, meningiomas are and where they are. And also you have to remember the very specific group of the falcotentorial, which is the pericircular meningioma uh, affecting the circular peripherally here and here. Uh, after after uh, Yezergil came, uh, Lily Hamshaker, a friend, uh, a close friend of mine, close friend of Jordan, uh, he published this paper back in 84, and he also described it in terms meningioma, but he simply, made a very uh, minor modification of the SRG classification. Then Majid Sami, Professor Majid Sami from uh, Hanover 96 uh, said, well, let's simplify things. Let's make them two groups. Either they are medial or lateral group. Again, this is uh, a simplification of the uh, complex uh, group of, uh, of uh, tumors. And then Bassioni came with uh, another uh, this is Hisham Bassioni from Essen, Germany. He said, well, let's classify them into six groups instead of five like Yazergil. But still, this is modification of the Yazergil classification. Uh, Chao Ying uh, from China, again, uh, recently uh, made a new classification of these tentorial meningiomas. Again, I, I stress the fact this are still discussing the tentorial meningiomas, which did not come yet to the falcotentorial. But this Zhao Ying said, well, let's do some of this classification. We classify them into type one, type two, type three. Are they in the anterior space or the middle institutional space or the posterior institutional space? So this is his paper published 2021, very recent publication. Are you in the anterior part or the middle part or the posterior part institutional space? And he classified type one in the type one, type A, one, type one A, type B, and type C. And the same thing with type two, A, B, C, and type three into three different parts, A, B, C, and D. Uh, to me, this is a complex classification. It will not stay in your mind. You cannot uh, put your case into one of these categories. Sometimes you will just uh, need a simpler classification. So I would recommend that we all go back to Yezergil classification for tentorial meningiomas. Now, we will not 
discuss tentorial meningiomas any further, we'll stop here and go for the falcotentorial meningiomas. So falcotentorial meningiomas, as I said, they arise at the junction of the forms with the tent here, this junction, whether above or below the tent. Simple as that. Falcotentorial meningiomas are specific subtype of the tentorial meningiomas. And thereby, they are pretty rare. 0.3 to 1% of all intracranial meningiomas. They are really very rare. I did not realize how rare they are until I really dug deep into literature. Let's see the publications. Uh, this is a very nice chapter written by uh, Michael McDermott from San Francisco. Um, Michael is, is known as the meningioma man, and I know him well. And in this uh, uh, chapter in his book, Handbook of uh, Meningiomas, uh, he uh, described these falcotentorial meningiomas as very rare. And in fact, he specifically mentioned every article that has been uh, published. And clearly, there is less than 100 cases being reported. Imagine only 100 cases of falcotentorial meningiomas around the world. And uh, here he just outlined some of these applications. Uh, again, I looked into literature and found uh, this paper, Falcotentorial uh, Meningiomas by Tomita, describing seven cases back in 95. Takakura from Japan described four cases in 10 years' time in Japan, known to have lots of brain tumors and vascular uh, regions. Michael McDermott also, back in 2003, described six patients he had in San Francisco area, and he is the meningioma man over three years period. From Rome, University of Rome, over 20 years time, they collected 13 cases. Again, this is just to show how rare these tumors are. My friend from Brazil, Benedicto Colli, uh, described also his collection here, and he described seven cases of falcotentorial meningiomas, but these were described within the context of tentorial meningiomas. But when I read this paper, I found only seven cases of falcotentorial meningiomas. Hisham Bassiuni from Hessen, Germany, came back again, and he made uh, uh, classification for falcotentorial meningiomas, and he uh, published 13 cases. So again, rarity of these tumors and rarity and difficulty of dealing with these tumors. From Barrow Neurological, Neurological Institute, or Neurological Surgery Institute, sorry, over 10, period, uh, 10 years period of time, 14 cases. Uh, Again, from Spain, published 2019, two cases. So the best classification now are talking about falcotentorial. We've just left the tentorial classification, but the best classification being gazelle field. But if you want to the falcotentorial, the best classification is done by Chambers Yoni from Eastern Germany. And he published this paper in Surgical Neurology 2008, and this classification is the gold standard. So these are the 13 cases he mentioned, and I will show you how he classified them. So he said, simple classification for falcotentorial. Either you are above the junction of the gallon and the straight, or you are below it. Or you are to the side of it, you are paramedian, or you are along the straight sinus itself. So really simple, surgically orientated type of classification. Let's go through them because they are beautiful. So type one. You can see that we are above the junction of the uh, intense cerebral vein and vein of gallon with the straight sinus. So the origin is the forks, posteriorly at the junction of the tent. This is the forks, this is the tent. So this is the junction, you are above this junction. This is type one, falcot internal meningioma above the gallon. Type two, it is the same, but it is below the gallon. So it is inferior falcotentorial junction. 
Type three, it is paramedian to the side. And type four, it is along the whole length of the, of the sinus. So really very simple, very logic, very surgically orientated type of classification, which I adopt fully. So what are the presentation of these tumors? You'd be surprised. Headache is the main presentation and it's mainly coming because they develop hydrocephalus because of the nearby aqueduct of sylpius, they can cause headache, they can cause by causing hydrocephalus. Of course, being near to the cerebral lung, the toxic gate, uh, pressing on the brainstem and on the crust would cause anaparesis. Uh, you may get psychological because you are pressing on the uh, medial side of the temporal lobe. You may get epilepsy if you are supratentorial incontinence. And the other main thing is visual. Visual is very much expected. Let's see. What are the visual manifestations of these tumors? Two types, either perino syndrome or homonymous field defect, or field defects in general. Uh, Henry Perino from France uh, described the perino syndrome. Basically, it is a midbrain compression at the level of the severe colliculus. So here you are at the level of the severe colliculus. You have the red nerve nucleus, the median fasciculus, the third nerve, the Cross cerebri, corticobulbar, corticospinal, substantia nigra, red nucleus, and so on. So, pressing on this at the level of the severe colliculus, you will get perino syndrome. And what is this perino syndrome? It is conjugate upward palsy. They cannot look up. They have convergence nystagmus. They have poor light reflex. Uh, the pupil are mid dilated. They have weak accommodation reflex. And sunset appearance, we all know this from the hydrocephalic babies, they have sunset appearance. And there is a little retraction, let's see that. So here's the patient. Being asked to look up, she can't. There's nystagmus. I think this describes the syndrome very well. Other manifestations are uh, visual field defects. Why is that? Let's see. Uh, of course, of the nerve, chiasm, tract, and then here you relay on the uh, lateral geniculate body, and then you have optic radiation, you have Myers lobe, and then you go into the visual cortex. Uh, the uh, images nowadays give you this. A tractography where you can see these structures and you can see how easily you can get visual manifestations if you have a lesion here or if you have a lesion that goes along the straight sinus here. Beautiful dissection. Um, this is beautiful. These are beautiful papers. Dissection mainly done by, yes, by um, uh, late Professor Rotten. And here you can see the optic tract laying into the lateral geniculate body. And then here give Myers lobe and then goes into the optic radiation towards the occipital lobe. Again, DTI, the uh, tractography, show you all these tracts. Again, a lesion here. A lesion here, a lesion here would cause major uh, visual defects. This is Myers lobe coming here and then optic radiation going to the occipital cortex. Of course, the optic radiation is lateral to the tapetum of the corpus uh, callosum. And then just medial to that is the, uh, the trigone and the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle. So ventricular system, trigone and occipital horn. And then as you go out, you come across the tabitum. As you go out, you will see the uh, optic radiation. And here is the geniculate body. So you have to come here to the uh, visual area, area 17, 18, and the associated area 19. So if you affect that area in one way or another by venous infarct, by retraction, by whatever, then you will get, get or the tumor itself can cause these visual manifestations. So occipital lobe is made of two parts, the primary visual cortex 1718 and the associated uh, visual area, area 19. In the primary area, you are aware of the visual stimulus. 
but in the associated area, you will analyze, you will see the movement, you will recognize it, and you will keep a memory of that. Beautiful paper from Japan, relationship between the brain tumor and the optic tract or calcarine fissure. So if you have a tumor here, what's the relation with the calcarine fissure? And what's the relation with the optic tract itself? And this is DTI again. So here, this tumor is, as you can see, anterior medial to the calcarine fissure, which should be here. Different from this, which is posterior rostral to the calcarine fissure. So each one of these would give you a different kind of visual field defects. This is posterior lateral to the calcarine fissure. So again, just going through them, this is different from this, different from this. And each one will give you different visual field defect. It is not only the homonymous hemianopia, the famous one. It's all sorts of uh, visual field defects. And these visual field defects could be congruent. They could be incongruent according to the area affected. So visual assessment, pre-operative and post-operative is very major issue here. And especially that visual complications of surgery are very frequent. What about the images of these lesions? MRI is the gold standard. You will see the uh, relationship with everything you want, of course, in the axial coronal and sagittal views. So these are different kettle of fish of uh, falcotentulin in Germans. And this is the, as I said, the circular uh, special subtype of the falcotentulin uh, tumors. And uh, this is a case of mine. 45 year old lady from Iraq with the uh, multiple meningomatosis, and one of them was falcotentorial. So, falcotentorial could be an isolated tumor or it could be part of uh, multiple tumors. In fact, this patient uh, was troubled by this, causing her epilepsy. So, we removed this and we kept just observing this one, and it did not change with time. I've been following her for now seven years. What about angiogram? What kind of angiogram you should do? especially if you want to operate MRA, conventional, DSA, CT angio, or what? The best and the golden standard is either conventional or CTA. MRA is not enough. It's not good enough. It's not only not good enough not to do MRA, but it is not good enough in these cases of Falcotentorial. Again, I really wonder how people around in the neurosurgical community would operate on any patient, whatever their problem, intracranial problem is, without having MRA and MRV at least. So MRA will give you just a rough idea about things. It is not enough in falcotentorial meningiomas. CTA, 3D, would show you a lot of information. Convention angiogram here will show you what I described before, the main supply of these falcotentorial meningiomas is the meningio hypophysial trunk. Meningio hypophysial tentorial branches, uh, the Italian arteries that we mentioned, the medial and lateral tentorial branches. Here is a beautiful angiogram showing this uh, meningioma being supplied mainly by the meningio hypophysial trunk. Again, here it could be supplied by choroidal artery, posterior, medial, and lateral branches of the posterior cerebral artery. They could be supplied by the posterior meningeal branch of the vertebral artery. What about venogram? Which kind of venogram you should have before you indulge in operating on these patients? You should, you cannot. You cannot count on MRV. MRV for a basic, simple thing in general information is good. How good is brain surgery without even MRV? It's not good. But in falcotentorial, MRV is not good. So MRI, you can use the susceptibility weighted image. You can use the conventional venogram or the CTV, CT venogram. So this is beautiful SWI, susceptibility weighted image, showing you the fine details of the venous system, anterior septal thalamus rate, internal cerebral veins, and so on and so forth, going into the vein of gallon. And I cannot tell you enough how many variations did I come across 
uh, in uh, looking into this uh, sustainability value of uh, in, in, in uh, Falcotin tolmini jobs. The variability of the venous system is so massive that you must know the anatomy well by doing these kind of images, especially so if you are dealing with the third or lateral ventricular surgery. So whenever you go to the ventricle, you must have these images. MRV is good, but it is just generally good. Venography in one of my patients, you can see the anatomy brilliantly here. You can see the internal cerebral vein, the straight sinus, the vein of Rosenthal, the uh, lateral sinus, the other sinuses as well. And this is the cavernous sinus and field betrothal, speed betrothal. So the anatomy here there as well, especially that if you want to go transbetrosal for whatever reason, especially for the tentorial meningiomas, for example. So uh, venogram, CT venogram is very essential. You can see your sinuses as well. You know where you are. What are the variations of the basal temporal veins? What are the variations of vein of present time? Uh, and so on and so forth. Here in this venogram, you can see that uh, the uh, junction between the straight sinus and gallium, which is here, is blocked. And you can see this, this depressed, the intense cerebral vein is depressed. So it's coming here and then going this way. So it is depressed. But here, when it joins the straight sinus and venum gallon, it is blocked. Again here, gallon is occluded and straight sinus is partially occluded. And in this particular case with this huge falcot and meningiomas, you can see that the gallon is closed and it, the, the transfer sinus is faintly seen and even the straight sinus is not well seen. You can have occlusion, of the vein of gallon with collateral damage. If you have occlusion of this, you will have something very strange coming up, which is patent falcine sinuses opening up. We have this uh, possibility uh, in our bodies that these falcine uh, venous sinuses, which are there in the intrauterine life, which and should be closed by the time of birth, they are there and they can open up when there is a suction of the vein of gallon or set signs. So a venogram is essential. How people would operate without it, I don't understand. Venogram, one of the cases here showing you the partial occlusion of the transfer sinus. In this case, uh, it's closed almost here. Also, it is closed. Another venogram with different kinds showing you different uh, information about these cases. Now, this is important. This slide is extremely important. A common intraoperative finding is a patent vein or a patent sinus, which was not visualized preoperative. This is a dilemma that you do your uh, venogram and you find that the sinuses are closed, and then when you go in, they're still patent, and then you'll face horrible bleeding. You have to study also the tentorial sinuses very well. This is a beautiful paper uh, showing you the complexity of these tentorial sinuses, the importance of how to open the tent and so on and so forth, and how to see these uh, sinuses. And these will open whenever there is an obstruction. And if you have to open the tent, then God would help you if you don't uh, know the anatomy well. So if you have a lesion in the posterior and sessural space, what is the differential diagnosis here? We have seen images of a farcotentural meningiomas, but this is just only part of the differential diagnosis. Look at that. And these are 90% uh, man cases, a germinoma, a teratoma, embryonal carcinoma, Choriocarcinoma, they all look like a meningioma. Pineoblastoma, yolk sac tumor, ependymoma, astrocytoma, glioblastoma, this is a case of mine, oligodendroglioma, a case of mine, and this is an intermediate tumor, again, a case of mine, a pineal tumor. And then comes, of course, the uh, falcotentorial. But falcotentorial also gets very uh, missed and confused with the another type of meningioma in the same area. So let me put it like this. If you find a meningioma, 
and you diagnose from the old differential diagnosis that this is a pioneer locus meningioma. This could be a Farcot interior meningioma or it could be a villum interpositum meningioma. What's the difference? Major difference. Major difference in everything, in the images, in the way you, at, you attack them, in the operation itself. Falcot interior, villum interpositum, they look the same. They are in the pioneer locus, but they are different, different group of, of tumors. So both are in the posterior and space. But if you look at the dural attachment, the villum interpositum has no dural attachment. If you look at the blood supply, the villum interpositum supplied by the internal arteries, while the falcon neural are more by the posterior choroidal arteries. One pushes gallon backwards, one pushes backwards, one pushes it anterior downwards, one pushes it back and upwards. So you can differentiate between both. Papers on this on the topic from Poland. Falcotinturin and villum interpositum, two distinct entities of the pioneer region. I agree totally. Meningiomas of the villum interpositum, surgical concentration, again, different from falcotinturin. Large giant meningioma of the posterior third ventricular region. Is this falcotinturin or this is a villum interpositum? Again, uh, to, uh, to make uh, eyes open about this topic. Uh, two cases of pioneer region meningiomas are derived from the arachnoid membrane, not from the dura. And these are villum interpositum meningiomas. Having done the differential diagnosis and B diagnosed the falcotinturin meningioma, what is the treatment? Uh, we have microscopic surgery, we have endoscopic surgery, we have radio surgery and radiotherapy. Of course, you only resort to these cases in very uh, specific limited cases. Uh, what do you do if you want to operate? And the surgery is the main stay here. You have to do full neurological examination. You have to do full ophthalmological examination. I sent my patient to uh, um, my friends of the phonologist who would do visual acuity, visual feeds, color vision, optic OCT, visual feeds, endoscopy, everything. Every patient, pre-operative and post-operative. And most importantly, that we include also Karnofsky performance scale. Every patient of brain surgery must have Karnofsky performance scale, not only for those metastasis cases uh, where Karnofsky will make uh, the decision, but it is important that we have Karnofsky performance scale for every brain surgery. Uh, this is vital to me. So full visual assessment, optic OCT, the fundoscopy, the thickness of the optic nerve and the visual feeds uh, that patients may have. Would you do embolization for these patients preoperative? Most of people would not. And the reason being that they are mostly not successful due to small or inaccessible feeders. And I showed you the intricacies of the blood supply of these meningiomas. So they are really difficult ones to embolize. Sometimes you need to embolize, but most of the time, it is really difficult and not helpful. So microsurgery is the mainstay. It is the treatment of choice. And your aim here is gloss, gross, not the gloss, gross total resection. And you cannot achieve 100%. You cannot achieve Simpson one or even two. So you are aiming at gross total resection as much as you can. And every approach must be tailored according to the case. Where is the tumor going? Supra, infratentorial, anterior, lateral, along the sinus, part of the sinus, lateral, and so on and so forth. This is a time-consuming surgery. And every paper I read speaks about long hours of surgery in the best hands, in the, in the meningioma men, 12 to 23 hours. So you may have two surgical teams to be trained together for this kind of complex surgery. Position, semi-sitting and prone, uh, concord, three, fourth, whatever. So this is uh, really one of these uh, positions. But I like the uh, sitting position in general. What are the principles here? Whatever the, the approach is, whatever the position of the patient is, you must have a neurosurgical, uh, neurophysiological monitoring, and you must have a neuronavigation. It is a must. If you don't, don't, don't operate on these cases. 
Uh, what about sinus repair? Should we follow the tumor into the sinus, take it out and repair and graft? This is very controversial. Most people don't. Some people would do. I don't. What if you find a venous sinus is infiltrated and it is patent? Leave it. If the sinuses are occluded, you ligate it and just at the uh, uh, junction between the open part and the closed part, and you can check that by Doppler. But if it's closed and you're sure it's closed by venogram and at operation, you can remove the confluence of sinuses. So intraoperative Doppler is useful. And if you want to divide it into a image, divide from posterior to anterior, parallel to the straight sinus. You may have a transdural, you may have a transosseous, you may have a trans skull drainage of these tumors. So be careful with your skull flap. Be careful of the bone and so on, that the bleeding could be there. If the vein of, of uh, gland is, is closed, you can clip it at the junction with the uh, straight sinus. Uh, well, one thing I hate is the shunt, and I say the best shunt is no shunt. Shunt is being abused all over the world, especially in this part of the world. It is totally abused. You ask one surgeon how many cases you do, I give you tell you 300 cases. What are they? 200 shunts, 100 division shunts, 100 infection shunts, and so on. So shunt is used indiscriminately to treat so many cases. I'm against that. Try to remove the tumor first, and then see whether the patient needs the shunt or not. If it is an emergency, and most of the time people would claim, oh, this was an emergency, two o'clock in the morning, put an external drain. You don't need, you don't want to put a shunt permanently in the body of your son or daughter. Remember something called trigeminal cardiac reflex. This is common in this area, falco tinctura, because you are in direct contact with the tent, and the tent is very, very much uh, rich in nerve supply. And trigeminal cardiac reflex, and I had it in about three, four cases. I've never lost the patient for that. You're just opening the tent and the anesthetist will tell you cardiac arrest. You stop, it will go away. And that's because these tents are supplied and they would cause a vagal nerve stimulation and cardiac arrest. So some people looked at the uh, the uh, innervation of uh, these of the tent. It is richly nerve supply, but most of the time they are leaving this edge less nerve supply. But most of the tent is supplied. Are you supply the straight sinus more than the transverse sinus or the opposite? But this area of the hiatus is less nerve supply, like this. So this is. Straight sinus, this is transfer sinus, this is less nerve supply. And one thing I do in these cases when there is hydrocephalus, not to put a shunt, but to uh, cannulate the occipital trigonal area, and uh, uh, this would decrease the, uh, the venous congestion in the brain edema. And still, we are talking about principles of surgery, whatever the approach there is. And this is uh, stressed very much so by Michael McDermott. Patient and family must be counseled that there will be a few days to a few weeks of cortical blindness, which luckily recovers in most of the, of the patients. But cortical blindness is very important in surgery of these cases. And McDermott would tell you that he used to tell his patients five times, eight times, 10 times, and they're still wondering why did the patient is having cortical blindness after surgery. What are the approaches? Many, simple, either supratentorial or infratentorial. That's the basic stuff. So many, interhemispheric, you go this way, you go that way, supratentorial, uh, supracerebellar, you go through the tent by occipital, you go between the two hemispheres, you can combine, you can have bilateral occipital. So to just go through them very quickly, supracerebellar, infratentorial, like you reach any, pineal uh, locus tumor, either you go above or be, uh, you go below the uh, tentorium and you go in midline, paramedian, or lateral, or lateral, you can use any variation of these according to the direction of uh, the tumor extension. Uh, again, this beautiful paper by Roten, late Roten, about which way to go, middle, paramedian, or far lateral, and what are you going to reach? If you want to reach this area, so you'll go midline and for tentorium, if you go little lateral, 
Paramedian, if you go that area here to the Parahippocampal gyrus, then you go to the far left. And this is the picture you are going to see. This is the picture I see when I operate on this area. And I have to have the image, the 3D image, the X-ray image of where it prevails is there. This is internal cerebral veins for vein of gallon. This is rosenthal. This is internal occipital vein. And this is the pre cerebellar vein or precentral vein, which most of the time you can uh, sacrifice without any uh, unwanted uh, effect on the patient. Uh, so if you go laterally, the far lateral, then you will come across and see the uh, parahippocampal gyrus and the uh, fusiform gyrus of the occipital lobe. Uh, if you want to cut the tent, you can cut it and again, posterior to anterior, and you can reach to that area uh, if the tumor is going there. The supratentorial occipital, also occipital transtentorial, simple. This area is uh, devoid of these bridging veins. So this is the fork, this is the tent. Forks tent, you want to cut the tent here. So forks tent, this is straight sinus. You want to cut it one to two centimeters away or parallel to the straight sinus. And again, all the time you are aware that this is the calcarine sulcus where the visual cortex is. So once you cut the straight sin, the, the, the tentorium along the straight sinus like this, so you have opened it. So you can also see the upper surface of the cerebral level. So you have a wide uh, surgical field. And this is what you are gonna see when you open the tent and then you will reach to your tumor. Uh, occipital transtentorial false sign. So you are adding another dimension. You are opening the forks. You are opening the fork in addition to opening the tent. So again, transtentorial, transoccipital, you open the tent, you deal with the tumor in that area. Then you open the, uh, the forks, you go to the other area and deal with it. Brilliant idea. So like this. Here you have opened the tentorium parallel to the straight sinus. And then you go this way and open the uh, forks just like that. And then you can get into the other area. So you can operate in both ideas. So this is by occipital uh, approach, beautiful approach. Papers written on this from Brazil about the occipital by transtentorial false sign approach. And from Japan, this is a very recent paper, 2020, uh, from Japan about this uh, trans by and uh, uh, by sign. Beautiful paper. You can combine. You can actually go supratentorial and different tentorial, uh, attack the tumor from all sides. And one of the earliest paper written on this combined by Lelyham Shaker and Atul Gower uh, back in um, 84 or something, a beautiful paper. And uh, Michael McDermott in 2009 described this combined approach in beautiful diagrams and illustrations. You can see the tumor here, supra infratentorial. So the tumor is being resected. And these are the patients that the reported non patients. And this is again to stress the fact you must tell the patient and their families about the possibility of loss of vision, which most of the time is temporary, but it could be permanent. So this is the chapter that Michael McDermott wrote about this uh, topic, and he came with this, uh, uh, um, let's say, plan of action, whether the tumor is smaller than three centimeters or more than three centimeters, and the extension of it and so on and so forth. And what do you do to the sinus? It's a beautiful chapter in his book. So here they have actually excised the turcula and excised the tumor completely. That's because it was completely closed. But remember, you can use the Doppler and remember that what appeared on the venogram as closed may be still open when you are operating. Sinus repair, controversial. Some people do it, some people don't, I don't. Uh, what about the complications of the surgery? Listen to this. Mortality before 1980 was 16 to about 50%. After, it is less, but it's still there. This is a major surgery. It's not for beginners. It's not for Speedy Gonzalez. 
So first of all, the complications, you develop a new cranial nerve deficits, you develop hemiparesis, memory disturbance, speech disturbance, CSF leak, which is one of the commonest. And of course, you have uh, venous infarctions, one of the complications of the surgery. Also, you can get perinoid syndrome as a result of surgery, and you can get any type of these uh, visual defects, homonymous semianopia, inferior upper quadrantic, lower quadrantic, scotomas, even visual hallucinations uh, can occur. And why is that? Either you damage the upper edge of the calcarine fissure, cause some ischemic changes to it, your attraction is there, causing congestion. You damage some of the venous structures, like, like the calcarine vein, which goes into the internal subtal vein, which goes to the vein of Dallin. Uh, you section the territorium, which contains the uh, collateral venous channels, so the, the congestion would occur. And most importantly, that your retractor was over the pre -kings. So this is very seen on the DW1. The fusion studies, you can see the ischemia uh, post-operatively in these patients. Very important topic to be addressed in every single case. Beautiful paper about the, uh, the uh, perfusion uh, of these uh, areas here affected by this surgery. This paper from Japan. As I said, the complications are many. Histology uh, could be uh, any grade, grade one, two, or three. The 15 types that we know of meningiomas are there. We have seen them. Most of these tumors are grade one. Some of them are grade two. I have not seen grade three. And myself and my colleague, Dr. Hassan Farsa, published this paper about the about 300 meningiomas that I have between him and I. I have more than that, I have about 1,000 meningiomas. Uh, but this 300 between me and Hassan Farsa, we looked at the parameters of what is the cause of recurrence. Uh, endoscopy is, is very important. These are the endoscopists, and most of them are friends of mine, and I'm, I'm proud to be friend of and connected to these people. Uh, they've used the endoscope to reach to the uh, pineal area in different uh, locations, uh, published many papers about surgery uh, by endoscopy to the pineal locus, including meningiomas. Uh, from China, the same paper, pure endoscopy for surgery in that area. And also here, another paper uh, also uh, on the endoscopic use for pineal Locus tumors. Mainly it is pinealomas more than meningiomas. You can use the endoscopy as assistant uh, to assess your surgery, and then you can see if you have left any tumor there. And look at this beautiful view of vein of uh, through the endoscope. What about irradiation? If you have a tumor, you may need to give radiation, IMRT or stereotactic radio surgery. This is radiotherapy. And this is radio surgery. And we in Jordan had our first gamma knife. It was the first gamma knife in the Middle East back in 1996. And this is myself, 25 years younger. So this is one of the cases we treated uh, with the gamma knife. Gamma knife is useful, but uh, don't allow people to abuse it. <coughs> Sorry. Jason Sheehan. Uh, published this paper about gamma knife radio surgery for tintorid meningiomas back in 2011. 35 patients, four patients, they did not uh, respond and they increased the volume needing surgery afterwards. Paper by Dade Lansford Group uh, from Pittsburgh, 41 patients, yes, are tintorid meningiomas, 41, two increased in size. They did not respond to treatment. So even ready surgery had its own complications. It's 8%, some of them transient, some of them permanent. And this paper about delayed transmitted neurology after radiosurgical surgical treatment of tinturial meningioma. Uh, tell you about my personal experience in a hurry. I use the sitting position. It's my favorite position. I also use the prone position, but most of the cases I use the semi-sitting position. Uh, to be seated, your arms resting is very important. Uh, using the supracerebellar supra infinite internal approach, and the pictures I'm going to show you are all from my cases. So this is the approach. Uh, you go above the cerebellum, under the tent, and you will find this thick arachnoid, very thick. The thickest arachnoid in your body is there. 
and you can, uh, this is not from my cases, uh, this is textbook just to show the precentral vein and vein of resentile. Now these, the other cases are here and they are mine. And this also showing the trochlear nerve. And once you remove the tumor, then you will have this view of the tent here and the veins in this area. The area of the quadrigeminal system, the superior and inferior colliculus. And if you open the third ventricle, preserving those veins. This is, these are cases of mine, taking still pictures during surgery. <coughs> Roof of the uh, third ventricle, you can see the choroid plexus. Even you can see the interthalamic adhesion uh, just from your position as you go through the posterior part of the third ventricle. A uh, beautiful view in one of my cases where you can see the uh, posterior medial choroidal artery supplying the roof of the third ventricle, the coronal plexus there. Having finished and you are retracting, you can see the veins that you have preserved. You can see vein of gallon, you can see vein of resentile. This is one of my cases. And then the supratentorial, occipital transtentorial, uh, you have gone into this area, which is devoid of bridging veins and you have attacked this tumor as described before. My personal experience in the 30 years time are eight cases. Eight cases is a big number in this kind of tumors, especially that you know now that only 100 cases have been reported in literature. I'll show you some of these cases in a hurry. 45 year old female patient with this uh, lateral tentorial type, uh, pre-op. You can see these uh, sinuses closed. And this is post-operative total radical excision. And this is the patient herself with her follow-up. Another patient who came from outside Jordan, as I said, Jordan is a medical hub in the Middle East. We get patients from all over the Arab world and beyond, uh, from uh, North Africa and so on, and from other countries. Uh, this is a 32-year-old patient who came from outside Jordan. And he had this tumor in his country. He's 32, this falcotentorial meningioma. Unfortunately, he was operated upon by an experienced surgeon at St. Elsewhere outside Jordan with no benefits. He came to me and as you can see, there's been damage to the brain, but no damage to the tumor. The tumor is still the same. And you can see the tumor is going through the tentorial hiatus. You can see the sinuses are closed, totally closed. I'll show you the surgery now. Again, not all of it, but uh, this is a 3D and I will transform it into 2D. We all do, our all surgeries are in 3D. We've been doing this for 10 years or more now. You can see here that we have done embolization for this patient. So you can see the embolic material within the tumor tissue using the ultrasonic aspirator to grossly remove the tumor. Here is the tent, and here we are separating the tumor from the Gliatic occipital loop. You can see the tent here. We are on the one on the right side this way to the tentorial hiatus here. So we've removed this supratentorial part, uh, securing hemostasis from the superior part of the tent. You can see the tent and the supratentorial part, but here is the hiatus and we want to go through there. So now we are opened and here we open to the, the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle, actually now inside the hiatus. So this is the tent on the right side, this is the hiatus. This is the tumor that we have seen going through the uh, posterior part of the hiatus and the quadriceminal system. So we'll just go through that quickly. Again, here the tent, the tentorial hiatus. We are opening the tent, and when you open the tent, you always have a bleeding. You have to be prepared for that, uh, and uh, you know how to deal with it. Now we're opening it more to get the inflatentorial part, the part that is going through the tentorial hiatus. And you will soon see here the arachnoid covering uh, vein of gallon. 
So this is very tricky surgery. It is not for the beginners. It's not for the novices. It is not for the 3D Gonzalez. This is a very complex kind of surgery. And I'm really proud that I have this uh, kind of number of uh, cases. Uh, I was lucky, simply lucky to have this kind of cases. Okay, we'll go for the second one. Uh, this is the post-operative of the patient. We have obviously done a very good job, extremely good job. I'm proud of that. The patient who came to us, he hemiplegic, could actually raise his arm post-operative and his eye uh, manifestations uh, were normal. Uh, another case, a 37-year-old male patient with this uh, falcotentural meningioma. This is a preoperative axiom. You can see the tumor. You can see how widely separated the posterior cerebral artery are and the calcarine arteries and the temporal occipital arteries are uh, separated. You can see the straight signs. You can see the tennis cerebral vein of gallon. And you can see that it is encroached upon. Let's see the surgery now. So uh, this is mainly intra uh, tentorial, so uh, infra tentorial supra cerebellum, uh, removing the tumor gradually. Using ultrasonic aspirator, using the uh, neural navigation, and still there is some tumor attached to the tent there. And this is the end of it. Here you can see the uh, collicular area. Okay, let's go now for the next one. I think I just need some like uh, five minutes more, and then. Uh, this is the post-operative pictures of the patient. If left this area where the tumor is attached to the uh, junction of the vein of Gallen with the straight sinus. Uh, this patient, we gave radiotherapy. And here's the patient after uh, surgery and follow up, doing very well. Another patient, 47-year-old male patient with this huge tumor. Uh, uh, obviously, this tumor is above the uh, tentorium, so you'll go uh, this way, trans parietal. And this is the post-operative, again, having done a very good job here. Another case, 55-year-old patient with this tumor and the surgery. Similar to the one I've shown you, so I'll go through it very quickly. So this is the tumor on the surface, the velcate from inside. And then you are here careful where the vein of gallium is and the vein of Rosenthal is and the superior and inferior curriculus. These are the branches of the severe cerebellar artery. So debulking would allow you to go around the tumor and achieve radical excision, preserving the venous structure as you can see here. This is Venom Prosentar. This is last piece. Here we're looking at the quadrigeminal uh, severe inferior curriculus, and you can see the veins quite clearly. Actually, you can see here the uh, posterior cerebral artery. So radical excision, preserving the uh, neurovascular structures. Here, a very delicate area where the vein of gallon is. You work slowly, carefully. Again, here you can see that we are separating it from the uh, stereocerebral artery. We're reaching to the venous angle, the apex of the tent. Again, 
you can see still tumor there. You can see the arterial branches. We dissect the arachnoid away from the tumor, which is a basic surgical principle. Debulk, dissect, debulk, dissect, and so on. So this is the final view, supracerebral inflammatory. Uh, this is the post-operative. Again, we've left a small piece of the tumor at the junction of the pen of gland with the straight sinus. But this arrow, I don't know, this is not uh, this is not my doing, somebody has. Uh, let me just remove it. I, I just will continue, I just mute it, no problem. So this is the post-operative of this patient. Another case with this uh, facultin tour that's going along the straight sinus. 36 year old male patient, and you can see that most of the patients are males. And this is the post operative. I skipped the uh, video for the sake of time. And last patient is this uh, little para uh, turcular uh, tumor. Uh, again, I'm going to go through that very quickly, it's just repetition of what we've seen before. The same principles apply, and so on. For the sake of time, we'll skip it. And this is the post operative. And this is the patient itself. With this slide, I have finished. I thank you for being with us and I'm ready to take your comments and questions. Very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Sabaya. Okay, the floor is open for any comments or questions. Just step forward. Go ahead, Sammy. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Speyer, for the excellent lecture. Really, uh, we are happy to have uh, some physicians like you doing excellent job. Uh, yes, as you know, all that uh, the aim usually is to achieve the maximum removal of the tumor while maintaining a high quality of life. That's what, we are, what you are doing. Okay. Uh, just I would like to comment that uh, usually, yes, we use uh, the radiation therapy mainly when the removal of the tumor is partial and uh, we use the IMRT, IMRT techniques or the stereotactic. And uh, since two, three years ago, usually we are using the uh, a new hypofractionation techniques that we are giving 40 grays in 15 fractions instead of uh, giving 54 grays in 27 fractions while we are saving time and uh, less inconvenience for the patient. And uh, it's very safe and the patients are very happy. Uh, thank, thank you, you again, Dr. Speer, for your excellent job that we are really happy with you. Thank you, Sami. And uh, just to tell the, the, the audience that Dr. Sami is a senior oncologist. He is the chairman of the Pan-Arab uh, Oncology Committee. Any other questions or comments, please? Yes, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Hello, Victor. How are as, you? As, as, as always, amazing uh, lecture, very nice uh, pictures and surgical cases. Uh, I have uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, why not uh, to make uh, this uh, kind of difficult removal of meningio in two times? Two times, not two teams, two yeah. times. Sure. One surgery today and the next one in three or four days more by sure. the same by the same brain surgeon. Sure. 
I agree with you. You can do it by two teams uh, alternating in the same session, or you can do it by two teams alternating in different uh, situations, or by the same team in two different days or weeks. So you can play it the way you like. But it is a very lengthy surgery. It needs a high stamina physically and mentally. And I've been trained to have this physical stamina and mental stamina. You cannot lose your concentration for a second, even when you are closing the skin. Okay. Um... Is uh, uh, nowadays is uh, uh, we have a, a great possibility to have a, a legal pursuit uh, because uh, of uh, some damage for the patient and the family members uh, can go to the to a US, a legal demand. Yeah. So who is going to be the responsible for the surgery? Yeah. The first team or the second team? So I think uh, in this case, uh, we could have a, a big problem uh, because uh, first team is, going, is, is not going to accept responsibility uh, or uh, vice versa, the second team. All right, so I can classify your questions into two main types. First one is uh, if some patient, a patient had surgery with some team and it failed, would you, would I accept to go again after a failed surgery? The answer in most of the time is no, unless the patient is really desperate. But I usually advise the patient to stay with his doctors or in his country. But sometimes you look at pictures and you say, this patient did not have any chance whatsoever. And this patient is still there, I can't help him. So it depends on what, what is the case. Is the patient good or bad? And whether the one who has done it is really an amateur or a good surgeon. And then you decide. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Thank you, Victor. Congrats. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments? May I ask a question, please? Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor uh, Ibrahim Zbaih, for this uh, excellent uh, lecture and excellent work. Thank you. Uh, did you have some uh, case of uh, intraoperative edema? Can you make some comment on this? Sure. No, I didn't, because I'm very careful with these cases. I prepared them very well. I can postpone the patient for a month or two months unless I'm really ready. So I do every possible investigation to be sure, every possible consultation there is. I only operate when I'm only sure. So I've never had a patient who had developed edema during surgery. And what I do, and for all these cases, whether that's prone position or sitting position, is to tap the occipital horn, the trigon of the lateral ventricle to drain some CSF. And once you remove part of the tumor, drain more CSF, then the brain is relaxed. So luckily, I've never had any intraoperative edema. Thank you. Thank you. I can see among the audience, John, that my daughter is there, Asil Spare. Asil is the final year residency program. In two months' time, she would finish her, her board and she will become full fledged neurosurgeon. Hello, Asil, if you are there, come over. Hello. Hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm very happy, of course, with the lecture because, you know, guys, I, I, I know what, what happens behind the scenes and I can see how much effort he puts into these lectures and how much time he puts into them. And this passion he has for teaching is very contagious. And um, I'm very lucky to have Dr. Ibrahim as my mentor. And as my father, of course, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky. So thank you for everything you do for us as surgeons, as students. Um, thank you. There's nothing we can say or do that can 
express the amount of gratitude we have for you. Thank you, Azim. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm proud of you. I'm proud that you actually choose this path. Actually, I try to dissuade Asil from going into neurosurgery. I said it's a tough job for a female, especially in the Arab world. She was very insistent. She doesn't want to be just another general surgeon. She wanted to have a neurosurgery with its all delicacies. She's a good student, and I'm proud of her. John, can you unmute Thank yourself? You. I'm sorry, she's in London now, right? No, no, she uh, is going to London uh, next year. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, more comments or questions from the panel? Uh, if not, uh, I guess we'll proceed. With the coach. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Sabaya made a Kahoot quiz that covers the material of uh, what he just talked about. Okay, so the instructions are, uh, you got to get your smartphone out, okay? Get your smartphone out, and I'm going to give you instructions, okay? Go to Kahoot.it. Now, you see this here, Kahoot.it? Go to this address on your smartphone, Kahoot.it, and... It'll show up when you get there. I'm going to go and log in now myself. And we'll take a few minutes. Just take your time. Kahoot.it. Okay, and the pin you put down 569. Five six nine nine three one zero nine three one zero. Okay, you can see we have people coming in. So Kahoot.it, and then you punch in that that pin number. And we're going to start a series of 10 questions from the content that Dr. Sabaya lectured on. Okay. Okay. I think we're ready to start here. Uh, let me just hold on. Five, nine, three, one, two. And Redab, I hope you're in it. Okay. I think we'll start yeah. now. Yeah, please. Now, yeah, now. You'll see the questions and just obviously answer them. On your smartphone, you make a choice of what- Hello, Dr. Mohammed Can you see the, the, the question there? Sie war ja bei uns in die Uniklinik in Düsseldorf wegen ihrer Aneurysmen. Okay, very good. Okay, excuse me, excuse me, sir. I'll talk to you after. Okay, okay. Answer the question: A, B, or C. Is the Yeah. I'll, I'll speak to you after, sir. Hello, Frau Kuhn. Dr. Mohammed here, the Neurochirurgy Clinic in Düsseldorf. Ich grüße Sie. Sie waren ja bei uns wegen die Angiografie. Gut, ähm, es ist so, da sind die, mehrere Befunde in die, in die Angiografie. Excuse me, excuse me, we're Sie playing a game. Und, so, excuse me, sind, excuse me. Ja, die große ist so, dass das, ich denke, man sollte das behandeln, okay. ja, diese Anrismen. Uh, excuse und, me, ähm, excuse me. Eine oh. Möglichkeit ist, dass es nach mal kurz vorbeikommt, dass okay. ich Sie alles dann zeige und wie man das was okay. äh, we'll so behandelt. Und, um, excuse me, gentlemen. Excuse me, gentlemen. Und die andere Möglichkeit ist, dass um, 
weil sie sagen, sorry, dass, äh, dass er sie auch so Richtung sorry, Behandlung I'm tendieren, dass man. I'm sorry about that. We'll, no, we'll, we'll return. Okay, we'll return. Sure. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're on. We're still on. We took. We went through question one. Okay, we're going to so, question two now. Okay, question one. Then let's uh, comment on it. And the question was, which of uh, those veins can be sacrificed during surgery with no harm to the patient in most of the cases? Which one of them? Internal occipital vein, you can't. It's very important. Calcarine vein, it will cause blindness. Precentral cerebellar vein uh, is uh, one that everybody can sacrifice in most of the cases without any help to the patient. So those who answered uh, precentral cerebellar vein, five of them uh, are correct. Very good. Okay, on to the next question. We'll see you. Creative Yak has got into space one. Or a quadrigeminal cistern is formed by. The answer on your smartphone, a, the right color. Okay, we got three answers. And Dr. Sabaya can go over it. Okay. Okay, correct answer. Cerebellum, you want to speak about that, Dr. Sabaya? Yeah, the floor of the quadrigeminal cistern. Quadrigeminal cistern is a pyramidal in shape with the floor being made, or anterior wall is made by the uh, uh, superior anterior colliculus and pineal gland. So it is sort of leaning forward, and this is the anterior wall, while the floor is the cerebellum, and the roof is the splenium, the corpus callosum. So cerebellum is the correct answer, that this is the floor of the quadrigeminal cistern. That was a tough question. Only one got it right. Yeah. Okay, Creative Jack is still in the number one spot. In the ambient cistern, which structure is superior to the others? Let's see how we go here. Okay, I think everyone got that. Oh, Bain of Rosenthal. Can you go over that, Dr. Sabah? Sure. Ambient cisterns contain the vein of Rosenthal, the superior cerebral artery, the posterior cerebral artery, and the uh, trochlear nerve. So the highest one is the vein of Rosenthal. So it is above the severus cerebellar, above the posterior cerebellar, above the severus cerebellar, and above the uh, trochlear nerve. So then presentation is the correct answer. Okay, very good. That's another tough question. Okay, Mighty Goat is taking a firm grasp for the lead. The number of reported cases of falco tentorial meningiomas in literature is... One hundred cases. Uh, that's the correct answer. Hundred cases is the correct answer. Uh, I uh, described during the presentation that these uh, falcotentorial meningiomas are rare, and uh, Michael McDermott looked into literature twenty twenty, and he could only find hundred cases. Uh, that does not include my seven cases, eight cases that I described. So uh, all in all, it's about hundred. Uh, it is not uh, sixty. It is not two hundred. Okay, very good. Okay, you see here, Mighty Goat does not retain the lead, creative yak. Okay, fifth question, the calcarine sulcus is surrounded by... Five answers. Yeah, I put a lot of time on.
Unions and Lingual Gujarai. And that's the correct. That's the correct answer. Uh, the uh, the Kalkarin Circus uh, runs between the Cuneus and Lingual uh, Gujarai, which is both are within the occipital loop. Uh, uh, Cuneus and Fusiform is not correct answer because Fusiform is far lateral, and uh, uh, Parahippocampal is far anterior. So the Kalkarin Circus is between the Cuneus and the Lingual Gujarai of the occipital loop. Very good. Most of them got it right. Yep. Overwhelmingly, Creative Gap retains the lead. Sixth question, Italian arteries, Bernasconi and Cas... Casinari. Nari Casinari, branches of. Pick the color on your phone. Hey, well, I think most got that right. That's the correct answer, right? Yeah. Uh, these Pernasconi and Casinari are very famous. They have musical names, so everybody remembers them. And they are branches of the meningoapphysial trunk, which is coming from the uh, posterior genome of the carotid artery within the uh, cavernous sinus. Uh, Interlateral trunk is another branch of the cavernous carotid, but does not give the meningoapphysial trunk. The lateral segment of the carotid artery has only the median artery as a branch. Were they neurosurgeons, Bernasconi and Castanari? Yes, they were, An anatomists mostly. Oh, okay, very good. Okay, most got that right. Seven got that right. Let's see if Creative Yak retains the lead. Next question is number seven. Main supply of falcotentorial meningioma comes from? Hey, the, yeah, the correct answer is antenna carotid. These two Italians, the Casinari Bernasconi, is the main supply uh, to the tentorial, falcotentorial meningiomas. People think of uh, falcotentorial being back, posterior, uh, the posterior hiatus. So they think of the severe cerebral and posterior cerebral, cerebral artery as the main. They contribute to the supply of these meningiomas, but they are not the main supply. The main supply comes from anterior, from the uh, Italian arteries, Italian uh, branches of medial and lateral tentorial branches, branches of the meningeal hypothesis. So internal carotid artery is the correct answer. Very good. Okay, see, uh, Kriyaviak retains the lead. Yes, retains the lead. Okay, now right, artery of Davidoff and Schechter is a branch of, a lot of interesting names here. Yes. Leave it up in Schrechter. Yeah, they both uh, described this artery. Okay, correct answer. The correct answer is the posterior cerebral artery. Um, this is a, a kind of artery which is not well recognized. That's why I put a question about it, and that's why I put it in the presentation. People must know about it. It is not well recognized. That's why we have concentrated in it. Artery of David and Schuster. Uh, it is a branch of the posterior cerebral artery. It goes around from P1 uh, segment uh, or junction of P1 and P2 and goes around the brainstem into this notch where the force meets the uh, the tentorium and they supply it there. So you can see it in cases of falco tentorium meningiomas, but you would not see it in our ordinary angiogram. Very good. Okay, going to number nine. Let's see if Kriyav Yak retains the lead. So widens the lead, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, and main presentation of falco tentorium meningiomas is, okay, I think most will get this one. Hopefully. Yes, overwhelmingly, they got it. Okay. Absolutely, yes. Uh, headache is the main presentation, and I said mainly because the tent is rich in uh, nerve supply, 
so you have the dura there, you'll cause headache, and you'll have headache because of hydrocephalus. Visual is there, epilepsy is there, but the commonest presentation is headache. So again, the value of taking good history and examination of the patient coming with headache, there's nothing called normal headache. There's nothing called headache that comes to people. The ordinary headache, I hear the word ordinary headache. Yes, I have ordinary headache, which I take one analgesia, Panadol or something, and it goes off. Headache should not be there. If it is there, there is a reason for it. So investigate the patient for you. Very good, good message. Okay, Kriyaviak widens, maintains the lead. Okay, last question. How much visual complication after the supertentorial approach for falcotentorial meningioma is? It's a tough question. Okay, most got that right, okay. Go yes, absolutely. Time. Yeah, cortical blindness is very important and uh, Michael McDermott does not stop telling people about it. In a personal conversation, uh, once he told me, Abraham, I tell patients about this not one time, not seven times, but eight and nine times. And still, if it happens, they ask me, why did it happen? You must have a, a consultation and consultation with the patient and the family that this is most likely going to happen, either by retraction or by just uh, affecting the venous drainage of that area. Uh, and uh, luckily enough, unfortunate enough, that most patients recover. But you have to be aware of this, and patients should be uh, prepared for this. Okay, very good. Okay, let's get the final tally. That's it. We're going to crown the winners. Okay. Okay, number Creative Yak. Looks like Creative Yak has got it. Okay, I, I don't want to screw this up. I did before. Creative Yak, number one. Now, I don't know if Creative Yak wants to identify himself or herself. Uh, Victor, is that you? You don't, can Creative Yak identify them, themselves? All right, okay, you won again. <laughs> oh my God, great job. Because this was, this was a difficult test. It was not easy. It was very good. So you earned that. I'm still uh, disappointed so. that I got three wrong because I my attention was distracted in between <laughs> post-op. But no, Professor no. Sabe, can I salute you not only for your excellent results, but for excellent genes that I understood today and your humility of teaching and reaching out to people to educate. It's I, my pleasure. I, I, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I salute you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very well, much. You know, you know, I got some good news for you, Dr. Zubaya. During the webcast, uh, Yuha wrote to me, and he would like to invite you to speak at his grand rounds on the 17th of September. Who's that, sorry? Yuha. Yuha invited, yeah, Yuha invited you September 17th. It's a Friday morning. I'll, I'll send you the information. Would you please? Yes, it's my pleasure. Yuha is a great teacher. He's a great surgeon and uh, a great well, friend. Yeah, and he's, Jordan. He's, yeah, he said some good things about you, and he wants for you to speak. Thank you very much. I'm ready. Thank you. Okay, very good. Okay, thanks, everybody, for coming, and stick around. I'm just going to stop the broadcast. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bye-bye. Stick, stick okay. around. Stick around.